Can't you just feel it? The conflict is becoming apparent in our culture. It reminds me of those words of John Paul II. We're now living in the final confrontation between the gospel and the anti-gospel, between the church and the anti-church, between Christ and the antichrist. And if we don't choose to know God's word, to believe God's word, to follow God's word, we're going to be a sitting duck for all kinds of confusion, all kinds of disorder. Those are really important choices that people have to make. And these choices are difficult. Who am I going to marry? What kind of life am I going to live? How am I going to raise my kids? What am I going to do with my time, my talent, and my treasure? And I have to make a choice today. Jesus says to each one of us, I came that you might have life and have it to the full. The question is, do we want it? Welcome to another week of The Choices We Face. I'm Peter Herbeck. Our guest today is Roy Shulman. Roy grew up in a conservative Jewish family in a suburb of New York. He went to MIT, he got his MBA at Harvard, uh, was appointed to the Harvard uh, Business School faculty, and somewhere around that time had a major conversion, one that he described as an unexpected and instantaneous conversion to Christianity. Now that's amazing. So I'm so glad to have Roy on the show today to tell us his story, but also some important things about what the conversion of the Jews in our time uh, what it's signaling for us and how it fits into God's plan of salvation and salvation history. Welcome, Roy. Thanks. Thanks for having me. I really am delighted to have you on Good. the program. So uh, let's just start with wherever you want to start in your story and your testimony. Well, I, that's a good way of introducing myself, I guess. So um, I'll try to keep it short. Um, as, as you mentioned in the intro, uh, I was born and raised very Jewish. My parents were both German Jewish Holocaust refugees. And uh, the whole world that I grew up in was Jewish, and I went to Jewish religious education all the way through beginning of school until university. And uh, then I went to MIT. I lost my faith there, my Jewish faith there, under the fake, fraudulently scientific worldview that religion is just a medieval superstition and, and that man came up with until he had science to give him all the real answers to everything. Of course, we know that nothing could be further from the truth, but I didn't know that at the time, so I bought it. Uh, became, uh, went to Harvard Business School, got an MBA, was invited to join the faculty, was a professor at Harvard Business School. And that's really where my witness testimony begins because all my life I felt there has to be a real meaning and purpose to life and some time when I'm older I'll come into that meaning and purpose, which I thought as a child would come from entering into a personal relationship with God. Um, and which I actually thought would happen at Bar Mitzvah, which is like the Catholic confirmation when the child is 13. It didn't happen. That was actually one of the saddest days of my childhood. But then I externalized the, um, the uh, yearning for meaning, thought it would come when I began university or when I began my career or so forth. But I was already more successful than I ever expected to be in a secular career being a professor at Harvard. But life still had no meaning or purpose. You know, we're a chemical accident. We live for 80 or 90 years. We die. There's no meaning or purpose to anything. But at this point, there was nothing more I could imagine might hold the promise of meaning in the future, because I wasn't about to be more successful than being a Harvard professor. So I fell into the darkest despair of my life, and in that I was walking in nature one morning, and I received the extraordinary grace, to say the least, that from one moment to the next, the veil between earth and heaven disappeared, and I found myself in the presence of God, very knowingly in the presence of God, seeing my life as I would see it if I looking back over my life after death in the presence of God. And I saw and understood how I would feel about everything after I died. I saw my greatest regrets would be all the time and energy I had wasted worrying about not being loved when every moment of my existence I was held in an ocean of love greater than I ever imagined could exist. Um, I saw that absolutely everything that had ever happened to me had been the most perfect thing that could have been arranged coming from the hands of an all-knowing, all-loving God, not only including those things that caused the most suffering at the time, but especially those things that had caused the most suffering at the time. Uh, the most transformative aspect of this experience was to come into the full knowledge um, very, very deep, deeply that not only had God himself, the God who had created not only everything that exists, but actually existence itself, as we know it, not only had he been controlling everything that happened to me at every moment, but he had been watching over me, paying attention to me, 
knowing how I felt at every moment and caring about how I felt at every moment of my life as though I were the only creature he had ever created. And that was absolutely mind-blowing. And all I wanted to do after that experience was know who this God was, who my Lord and God and Master was, and what religion to follow to worship him and serve him properly. So I went back home to Cambridge where I was living. I had instantly lost any interest in teaching Harvard MBAs how to make a little more money, unfortunately. All I wanted to do was worship and serve my Lord and Master That makes sense when God. you actually meet the living God. Exactly. Uh, put Not only that, I, I mean, I was very selfish. I was a Harvard Business School professor, and I realized how stupid I had been to put all my time and energy into things that wouldn't do me any good even 100 years later after I'm dead. If I want to be smart and selfish, I would be working on my <laughs> bank account in heaven instead, right? Yeah. Which will, will literally benefit from 100 million years from now, you know? The net present value calculation was obvious. <laughs> so anyway, I want to know who this God was. And um, all I could do was say a short prayer every night before I went to sleep to know who this God was. And a year to the day after that first experience, I went to sleep and I thought I was woken. Now I understand my body was asleep in bed, but I thought I was awake. It felt like I was awake. My memory represented as though I was, was awake. And I was led to a room and left alone with the most beautiful young woman I could ever imagine. And I knew without being told that it was the Blessed Virgin Mary. And uh, the first thing she said to me was she offered to answer any questions I might have for her. So I asked her about five or six questions, which she graciously answered. Just to be in her presence was to be lifted up into a state of ecstasy greater than I ever imagined could exist, just to feel the purity and intensity of the love that flowed from her. And um, I was never stupid. So the next morning when I woke up, I realized that it had been Christ in that first experience. And I was hopelessly in love with the Blessed Virgin Mary. And uh, that led me fairly directly into the Catholic Church. Is, can I ask you at least one, what one, of the, one or two of those questions might have been? And what um, Sure. Um, the most overwhelming aspect of the experience was to be in her presence. And when I was in her presence, I not only felt, uh, first of all, of, of course, her beauty, but also mostly the beauty of the love that flowed from her. But I also actually saw her grandeur and her exalted state. And so some of my questions were about that. And one of the questions I asked, one of the early questions I asked her, it was almost an exclamation rather than a question. I said, how can it be? How is it possible? How can it be that you're so glorious, that you're so magnificent, that you're so exalted? How can it be? And her response was to look down on me almost with pity and shake her head gently and say, oh no, you don't understand. You don't understand anything. I'm nothing. I'm a creature, I'm a created thing, he's everything. Hmm. Um, and then again, out of my desire to somehow honor her appropriately, I asked her what title she liked best for herself. And she replied, I am the beloved daughter of the Father, mother of the Son, and spouse of the Spirit. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Also, I knew nothing about the Blessed Virgin Mary when I went to sleep that night. I mean, I had never touched a New Testament, literally. Yeah. So, and so all and of even this the whole new. concept of the Trinity was new to you at the time, wouldn't it? Would I think it I probably had heard about that you okay. know, on TV okay. or something, yeah, yeah. but I had never thought about it. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, one of the questions I asked her, because I had heard about the, I had heard the expression, the Holy Spirit, but I had no idea what it meant. Yeah. So I apologize for the way I phrased the question, but at one point, once I figured out this was about Christianity and I had no idea what the Holy Spirit meant, I had no idea that it was even a person. I said to her, what's this business about the Holy Spirit? <laughs> I didn't know any better. Yeah. And her response was just to look upwards with an expression melting with love and say, he's his gaze. Oh, my. So, yeah. So I had a great catechesis in a oh, short period. Really? A life-transforming catechesis. I could see what Amen. you Amen. What's a nice Jewish boy doing here, right? Of course. <laughs> yeah, right. So then where did it go from there? So, so the whole thing starts to come together. G Mary's drawing you to Jesus. Holy Spirit's drawing you to know Jesus. What happened I, Look, I, the thing is, the, the, the one, the only disadvantage of cradle Catholics is just not to know how absolutely uh, cosmic and central the faith is. I mean, yeah. to go from a, a kind of atheistic despair to knowing the truths of the faith that we live forever, that everything is enveloped by divine providence, that God knows us personally and loves us personally, 
I mean, nothing else matters in comparison to that. Yeah. So, of course, everything else just fell away, and, and I became a fanatic. Um, nothing else mattered, because nothing else actually does matter in relationship to that. Yeah. Um, so, I, I just, I basically, I lost interest in, in Harvard Business School. I just wanted to, you know, basically pray and, and read theology and learn more. What, how did this experience affect your, your own family, your parents, and how did they respond to what you experienced? I like to say they were fine with it for the first three years because I didn't tell them yet. I was okay. scared to. <laughs> but when I told them, they had um, a very strong negative response. Um, uh, but it faded over six months or so. I mean, they couldn't, um, I mean, uh, they couldn't maintain it because they still had their parents' love for me. So, so it became a stumbling block. It became an embarrassment. It became something they were ashamed of and they felt awkward about it. But they reestablished relationship with me after about six months. Yeah. And then during that time, you started developing maybe in the next decade of the ministry, really, some of the stuff you're doing right no, now. No, I did not, nothing, I, actually, okay. for almost 20 years. Wow. Um, I, I was just a fanatic. I was spending all my time at monasteries. I was exploring vocations to the priesthood and okay. to religious life and so forth, going on pilgrimage all the time. And uh, um, what, what happened, actually, was I was given this book to write, is, is yeah. the way and I, I think of it. just mentioned it here. Roy wrote a really fantastic book called Salvation is from the Jews, the Role of Judaism in Salvation History from Abraham to the Second Coming. Yeah, yeah. and I wrote that, I, I feel I was very heavily inspired. I didn't even know sometimes what I was writing when I was writing it. But um, I wrote that book I, uh, on my word processor. I never expected anyone to publish it. I had no credentials at all in theology. And a uh, you know, Harvard MBA isn't much of a <laughs> credential for writing yep. Catholic Jewish theology. I put it in a manila envelope, I mailed it to Ignatius Press, and another miracle was that they chose to publish it. And then when the book came out, that began my public ministry. Okay, yeah. This is, it's such a good book. I've, uh, I picked it up, I bought this years ago and read through it, and it's all full of markings and underlines and wow, and you know, so well done. It's really Thanks. well written. Yeah, no, I, I, I don't take credit for it. I, I have never before or after been in the state of inspiration that I was in when yeah. I wrote that book. Now there's lots to talk about in the book, but one thing in particular, I think it's chapter nine, you talk about the ingrafting, Romans chapter 11, is a yeah. big part of that chapter. Let's talk about that. Okay, because that actually ties into, you know, I, I alluded to my ministry, but I didn't say what it was. Yeah. But basically, um, it's got several components, but mostly it's to revitalize the Catholic impulse to pray for the conversion of the Jews, because that's, of course, somewhat politically incorrect and has fallen out of favor. But first of all, I know as a Jew, the whole inside, because what were the Jews? The Jews were created um, 4,000 years ago to pray for the coming of the Messiah, to yearn for the coming of the Messiah, to work for the coming of the Messiah. Everybody needs Jesus to be happy. But if there were one people who needed Jesus to be happy more than others, it would be the Jews, right? That's what they were all about. Yeah. And I know that hole inside that I had until it was filled by Jesus. And so, I mean, out of compassion, I have to have a passion for encouraging prayer for the conversion of the Jews. But also, as Catholics, we know from the New Catechism, paragraph 674, quote, the glorious Messiah's coming is suspended at every moment of history until his recognition by all Israel. The second coming can't happen until there's a widespread conversion of the Jews. And so that's another reason, as we look around the world and say, oh Lord, when are you coming back yeah. uh, to pray for the conversion of the Jews? And, and that mystery is actually explained in uh, Romans 11. And in fact, Romans 11 is the footnote to that paragraph in the, par in the catechism that justifies the assertion that um, the second coming can't happen until there's a conversion of the Jews. We're living at a time when probably since the very early church, there's more Jews, at least that's what it said, coming to believe in Jesus as Messiah. Some yeah. are entering the Catholic Church, some are entering Messianic Jewish communities. What's the importance of that, I mean, from your perspective? Oh, I think, I think I, well, I hope it's a sign of the times. I hope it's the beginning of the wave of the conversion of the Jews, which will um, ex culminate in the second coming. Yeah, okay. Uh, Romans 11, let's break it, up, okay. break it up a little bit. I just happen to have hey, there you go. a little official, it's an official Catholic Bible, even though I carry it around with me, it does, yeah. doesn't make it a Protestant Bible. 
Um, but in any case, um, uh, St. Paul in Romans 11 explains there are two really interesting mysteries. One is the mystery of the Jews' failure to recognize Christ when he came. And the second is the mystery of the interaction between Jew and Gentile in the period between the first and second comings of Christ. And both of them are laid out in black and white by St. Paul in Romans 11. So um, I'm, I'm not going to do justice to it because this is not a two-hour show, but right. I'll do my best. Right. Um, first of all, about the mystery of the Jews' failure to recognize Christ, because a lot of people just look at the behavior of the Jews in the New Testament and say, oh, they were stubborn and they were prideful and they were hard-hearted and they didn't recognize Jesus and so forth. But St. Paul actually says it was part of divine providence, okay? I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it sought. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened, as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that should not see and ears that should not hear, down to this very day. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see. So the failure of the Jews to recognize Christ wholesale, if you excuse the pun, was not entirely their own fault, but was a part of divine providence. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that should not see and ears that should not hear, down to this very day. Then Paul, St. Paul goes on to say why God did this. He says, so I ask, have they stumbled so as to fall? By no means, but through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Now if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? For if their rejection means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? So St. Paul is saying two things here. One is, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. He says this four times in those few verses. So what he's saying is that if the Jews had accepted Jesus en masse at the time he came, salvation would not have flowed properly to the Gentiles. And you see what he's referring to in the book of Acts in the first church council, the Council of Jerusalem. What was the first crisis in the early church that required the first church council? Are we allowed to let Gentiles into the church? Or is the church only for Jews? Right. You see where this mistake came from, because of course Jesus was a Jew, the apostles were all Jews, the 3,000 that entered the church on the first Pentecost were all Jews or proselytes. It certainly looked like the church was for Jews. And if a Gentile wanted to enter the church, they would have to first convert to Judaism. Be circumcised and the whole bit. Which I like to say would have had a crippling effect on the early <laughs> church. They would have had uh, in order to qualify for entering into the church. What um, made that clearly not the case, in addition, of course, to the first church council, was the fact that the Jews, by and large, did not enter the church. And very quickly, the church was visibly Gentile. But if the five million Jews around Jerusalem had all been the first five million Christians, it would have been much harder for the church to flow properly to the Gentile world. But St. Paul also says something else interesting in these same verses. He says about four times. Um, if their trespass means riches for the world and their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? For their rejection means the reconciliation of the world. What will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? So in other words, Look, if the Jews' rejection of Christ was such a blessing for the Gentile world, just imagine what a greater blessing their acceptance of Christ will be for the Gentile world. Mm -hmm. Again, it's not me, it's St. Paul. Right, right. So, um, and then he goes into his central image of uh, Jew and Gentile in between the first and second coming, which is this olive tree of salvation, a cultivated olive tree of salvation. The roots were in Judaism, the trunk was Judaism, the original cultivated olive branches were the Jews. But then St. Paul goes on to say, but if some of those branches were broken off and you, a wild olive shoot, were grafted in their place to share the richness of the olive tree, do not boast over the branches. If you do boast, remember, it is not you that support the root, but the root that supports you. Um, you will say branches were broken off so that I might be grafted in. That is true. But even the others, if they do not persist in their unbelief, will be grafted in, for God has the power to graft them in again. For if you have been cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree? So again, this isn't me, this is St. Paul, but he's saying, look, if you're one of those grafted in wild olive branches, in other words, a Gentile in the church, 
don't boast over the broken off cultivated olive branches. That's the Jews who rejected Christ. If you do, if you are tempted to boast, remember, God has the power to graft them in again. And when he does, they'll even be better suited to the tree because they were originally a part of that cultivated olive tree. Some people, some people have the wrong idea that somehow God tried it with the Jews and they said no, and then something totally new began instead of an organic reality, a spiritual reality. Right. Exactly. And so then this is, ties up with that teaching that the Jews, there has to be conversion of the Jews before the second coming. Because the picture is that this olive tree then composed of grafted in wild olive branches and regrafted in cultivated olive branches. Gentiles so the are, the wild, are the wild engrafted. Yeah. Regrafted are the Jews who did not receive Jesus, but then at a certain point did. Yes, exactly. Right. That, then the olive tree composed of those two sets of branches will be ready for the second coming. And St. Paul says this explicitly. He says, lest you be wise in your own conceits, I want you to understand this mystery, brethren. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles come in, and so all Israel will be saved. As regards the gospel, there are enemies of God for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers, for the gifts and the call of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient, in order that by the mercy shown to you, they also may receive mercy. For God has consigned all men to disobedience, that he may have mercy upon all. So this is a reason why God did this. God wanted it to be clear when anyone received the infinite gift of salvation through the church, it would be a sovereign act of his mercy. So all men had to pass through a period of disobedience, of being out of relationship to God. So when they came into relationship with God, it would be obvious to them and to everyone that it was a sovereign act of the mercy of God. The Jews at the time that Jesus came were in relationship to God. So they had to pass through a period of disobedience so that when they're brought into the church, it's a sovereign act of the mercy of God. The Gentiles were out of relationship with God at the time that Jesus came, so they could immediately come into the church and it would be obvious it was a sovereign act of the mercy of God. They all come Paul, by grace. Everybody comes by grace. Everyone comes right? from grace and it okay. had to be yeah. that yeah. way. Yeah. And that's why God consigned all men to dis disobedience was so that he may have mercy upon all. That's a really kind of shocking verse when you read it the first time. And when you hear that the first time or the second time or the third time, that God consigned all to disobedience. It makes sense the way you describe yeah. it. But God's mysterious plan and road to salvation is just different than I think most people would almost instinctively think is the right way to go. Yeah, well, we're, we're pretty presumptuous to yeah. think we know better than God right, how right. to work salvation yeah. out. Right, yeah. Well, that's really very, very, very powerful. Now, let me ask um, a question. You, you mentioned early on about uh, the relationship with, you know, Jewish people that, that was hard, your, your family was hard for you initially to talk about it. Mm -hmm. uh, in the church today, uh, the church, also the Catholic church, many voices in the Catholic church say it's not really right to talk to Jews about their Messiah, to, to try to evangelize them as it were, to help them come into the Catholic church. What do you think about that? I mean, obviously I know you have an opinion, but uh, as a Jewish person who has received Jesus as Messiah, has entered the Catholic church, what would you say about it to our listeners? Uh, I, 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 where can I start? And, yeah. and uh, I, I could never finish. Um, first of all, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. First of all, Jesus, if Jesus hadn't preached to the Jews, if Jesus had not thought that Jews needed him, he would have died of old age in bed. He was crucified not for evangelizing Greeks and Romans. He was crucified for evangelizing yeah. Jews, right? <laughs> when he sent out the disciples, did he say, go nowhere among the Jews, go only to the the Gentiles. No, he said, go nowhere among the Gentiles, go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Uh, when he talked to the Syro-Phoenician woman, you know, it's not right to give the food for the children, excuse me, I didn't say this, to the dogs. Yeah. It, clearly, Jesus came f for the Jews. He, he's what Judaism was all about, was the yearning for the Messiah. He's the Jewish Messiah. Uh, the Jews brought the greatest gift God ever gave mankind to the Gentile world by bringing about the incarnation of Christ and by spreading the gospel, by the way. How can the Gentile world not return the favor? How can the Gentile world receive, uh, withhold yeah. the same gift from the Jews? Yeah, I mean, every Jewish person was meant to be a part of this great work of God through the people of Israel. 
you know, the elected people, the chosen people who are meant to be that messenger. And they're still searching, aren't they, in different ways. And they're in secular ways. They're trying to... It, There's a tremendous despair. I know this from yeah. my own life as a Jew. I'm tempted to say, you know, I don't want to plug anything, but look at an old Woody Allen movie. I mean, Jewish humor is based on existential despair, which is actually based on the hunger for the Messiah, which hasn't yeah. come. Yeah. And they're trying to, in, in various ways to bring about some kind of messianic reality on the earth apart from the Messiah. That's right. right. It's the same messianic impulse that they then decide they have to invent psychotherapy or they have to invent Marxism or something because they feel called on to sort of redeem the world, to save the world. And without knowing that it was done by Christ, they look for secular ways to do it. Yeah, so good. Roy, if people wanted to get in touch with you, what, how could they do that? I have a website, salvationisfromthejews.com. Um, I uh, have a radio show on Radio Maria every Saturday. Uh, that's radiomaria.us if you're not in their broadcast area. Uh, a politically incorrect title of the show is um, Jesus, the Promised Messiah of Judaism. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, my website, salvationisfromthejews.com, is probably Very the good. Thank way. Very good. So, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks for having this me. Is good. I appreciate it. Friends, I want to tell you about a little book that I've just written called Unfailing Promises. You know, the, the Jewish people were the people of the promise. And when Jesus came and became one of us and died for our sins and made it possible for the whole world to come to know the Father and share in the promises of Israel, now we, we being engrafted, we now receive the promise. And the fundamental promise Jesus described as the Holy Spirit, the first real gifted grace that God wants to give to all of us is the gift of the Holy Spirit. You're baptized into Christ, you've received that that gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit who opens up to us the whole treasure of heaven and reveals to us the glory and majesty of Jesus. And that's for you. If you'd like a copy of this booklet, you can just write to the number on the screen or go to our website at renewalministries.net. But until next week, this is Peter Herbeck and Roy Showman saying, let's live in the promises of Christ.